Hello, everyone. I'm Roman Polnar, and on behalf of Hebrew Free Loans Business Circle, I'm delighted to welcome you to Food for Thought. It's a series of monthly conversations with experts in our community who have offered to share their knowledge and insight with us. And today we're hosting a panel of local residential real estate professionals to talk about Bay Area real estate. We'll explore trends, changes, and long-standing best practices to help buyers and sellers navigate this fa fast-paced real estate market and make informed decisions. And before I introduce our panel, I want to thank the Hebrew Free Loan of San Francisco for supporting our Northern California Jewish community for 124 years. And this series is another way to offer resources and support. So each person we're speaking with is a business owner with real world experience, and they're volunteered to share their insights that may help you navigate whatever you may be facing in your own life or business. And for those of you who are joining us live, feel free to ask questions in the comments below and we'll answer them toward the end of our discussion. And so now without further ado, I would like to bring our panel of residential real estate professionals, all of whom are Business Circle members and cover every major corner of the Bay Area real estate market from San Francisco to Marin to the East Bay, the Peninsula and the South Bay. So Daphna, Joan, Alana, and Herb, welcome to Food for Thought. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you. So uh, just before uh, we begin, and I just want to break this up into three main segments, uh, because I'm sure that a lot of questions that I have in mind, uh, a lot of our viewers might have in mind as well. And so I'd like to talk about current market trends that you're seeing in your respective markets. I'd like to talk about upcoming changes, but also talk about some of the longstanding truths. And so uh, to begin, um, or before we launch in, I'd like to ask all of you to introduce yourselves. And um, Ilana, why don't we start with you? Sure thing. My name is Ilana Minkoff, and I am a realtor with Vanguard Properties. I sell across the 7x7 seven seven of San Francisco. I help my clients move through the various chapters of their lives, whether it's first-time buyers or growing families who've outgrown their spaces, to seniors who are ready to downsize across the city. I love San Francisco and feel grateful every day to be able to work, live, and play in our great city. And you can find me on all the social media at live and play in SF. Thank you. Thanks, Solana. Uh, Daphne, how about yourself? Good morning. Thank you for joining us and thank you for, for supporting the Jewish Film Festival. My name is Daphne Mizlachi. I work for Coa Banker and we're Team Mizlachi. I've been a real estate agent for the last 40 years, specializing in the South Bay. I believe as a consultant, purchasing a home or selling it is a process and therefore a good real estate agent will walk you through to help you through all sides of the transaction. My passion is first time buyers, to take them by the hand and help them go through the process and make the first transaction a success to them. On the other side, now that I'm older, I find that the empty nesters need help to be able to take the time to understand their options and be able to find that perfect home so they can live there for the rest of their lives. Therefore, I would like to say, please find me at teamizrahi.com. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Daphna. Uh, Joan, how about uh, you go next, please? Sure. Hi, my name is Joan Laguatan, and I'm a San Francisco native. I grew up in the Sunset District across the street from Ocean Beach, and I've been a real estate broker for 18 years, having sold in six Bay Area counties. I specialize in residential sales. However, I've also done some commercial work. And I'm also very active in the Jewish community, having worked with nonprofits, synagogues, and for example, rabbis and families on their real estate needs. Thanks, Joan. Herb, Thank take us home. Thank you. First of all, I can't compete with the introductions that the three of you had. Joan, I actually grew up on the outer sunset as well, across from the ocean. I was on 46th Avenue. Oh. Um, I am. Um, I mainly have been working in the peninsula, San Mateo County, as well as the coastal communities. Did pretty good there, but my, my daughter, her kids, 
et cetera, moved to Danville. And so thus I've now moved to Danville. So now I cover pretty broad territory. Um, enjoy what I do. It's one of those things that you have to love it to be great at it. Anyway, I think I'll just stop here and we'll just move on. Thanks, Herb. Thanks, everybody. Well, like I said in the introduction, we've pretty much got every major corner of the Bay Area real estate covered in this panel. And um, just to kick us off in the first segment, talking about market trends, I would imagine that one of the top questions that you might be hearing from people is, how's the market? And so with that question in mind, um, why don't you uh, tell us what you're hearing or what you would tell folks asking how the market is. So uh, Daphne, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, I think when people ask me, how's the market? I say the market is great, but of course it depends where you're at because each area is very different. So you cannot say that the whole Silicon Valley is doing very well, but of course it also depends if you're a seller or a buyer, because if you are a seller, you there's some areas are not doing very well but if you do everything you need most likely you'll sell it for a good price on the other side i find that from a buyer's perspective this is a very very difficult time and so i'm a very visual person so i say buying a home today is like applying for university you get got to get all your docs in a row know what you want before you write an offer, because otherwise, because in Silicon Valley, we have so much cash. If you don't do all that homework, you are not going to be able to get the house you want. Uh, Joan, what would you say to that And when you hear people ask how the market is? Right. So when people ask me how the market is, that the answer really depends on who you're talking to. If you're a seller, the interest rates, um, which are so low by historic standards, combined with constrained inventory, have really pushed prices up, which certainly benefits sellers. However, on the flip side of that, if you're a buyer, it can feel really discouraging because you, you may be priced out of the market. Um, Herb, Ilana, what would you say? Go ahead, Ilana. So, I can only address San Francisco because our market is so nuanced. Parts of the city are doing phenomenal and parts are a little bit depressed right now. This is very typical of San Francisco. We tend to go in 10 year cycles with five to seven year upswings. 2020 was an anomaly. And we at this point have surpassed the 2019 prices and jumped right into 2021. 2020 almost doesn't count. But then you also have to look at different neighborhoods within the city. South of Market behaves very, very differently than the more sort of suburban -y areas like Noe and Coal Valley. Single family home market is very different than the condominium market. So it's so nuanced, it's really about knowing each micro market. And so I would say in general, we are on the upswing, but there are areas that are lagging behind. Okay, we'll circle back to some of those um discrepancies because it feels like the whole Bay Area real estate market is just on fire. But if there are opportunities in your respective areas, it'd be great to hear about them. But Herb, um, I want to circle back to you. And what do you hear that question come up often? And if you do, what do you tell people? I do. I continually, I play a lot of tennis. In the middle of a tennis match, somebody will ask me, how's the market? It's just like the typical question. Um, I think it depends on, on where you are and why you're asking. In general, like nationally, the number of transactions is greater than double of what it was last year, although inventory is lower, kind of strange. Um, and to put it in perspective, you know, buyers are always concerned about getting the best price and sellers are always concerned about getting the best price. About five years ago, my daughter was headed towards buying a piece of property and we knew we were going to have to overbid. And even though I'm explaining this to my clients all the time, I asked a friend of mine, which you know, Alana, um, what do I do with this? I'm gonna tell my daughter, right? Like 150,000 over. It was weird telling my own child that. And he looked at me and said, how are you going to fill in three months when it's gonna cost her 300,000 more than what it's listing at? This is nothing new. It's gonna be around for a while. 
And that's, that's my response. You want to sell, sell. It's a great time. You want to buy, buy. It's a home. Um, well, that's a, it's a good segue to the next question that has been in my mind, um, which is probably the second biggest question that I hear people ask. And that is, are we in a bubble? Because again, despite these um, discrepancies in different markets, it seems like prices have just been on a tear for the last few years. And so what are your thoughts? Are we in a bubble or do we still have room to, for the prices to continue to grow? I'll take that. Okay. Uh, I don't think we're in a bubble, just my opinion. There's forecasts that say over the next three to five years, we're going to see a 30% increase. Um, I'm not sure I buy that, but I think we're going to be seeing appreciation for a while. And at some point, it'll flatten out. I believe that possibly because of COVID, people are buying into the future. So maybe we've had more transactions because people looked ahead. But I don't believe we're in a bubble at the moment. I also don't believe that we are in a bubble and to be in a bubble would suggest that we are in an impending collapse and we don't have the same structural issues that we saw during the subprime crisis, for example, with no doc loans. And in San Francisco, it's such a beautiful city that I think it will continue to attract buyers locally and internationally who are seeking jobs and also want to just be in a cosmopolitan city and have that lifestyle. Mm. I would like to, uh, Ilana, would you like to go next? Sure, because I can follow up on the San Francisco. Okay. One of the things about San Francisco is 65% of our housing stock is rentals. Mm -hmm. We never have enough supply, which is why we go in these massive upswings every 10 years. So until we can figure out how to build more, we have a very limited amount of housing. We have an incredibly desirable city. We have tons and tons of jobs that come and go, but mostly come. We will always have people coming here. And as long as they want to come, there will always be a housing crisis here. And as long as there's a housing crisis, there's not gonna be a bubble because there's nowhere to go but up in prices. So yeah. it's always a good investment to buy in San Francisco. I would like to go back to the same thing. I don't believe there is a bubble, but in my area, we have a very interesting phenomenon. We have a lot of young people who are sitting with so much stock and mm. so much cash, which I call monopoly money. Therefore, when they're paying all these expensive money, spending all this money, they're really playing with monopoly money. Therefore, and compared to most of us who had to scrounge around the 10, 15%, two things will happen. One is they're putting a lot of cash. Therefore, if the market slows down, the loan portion versus the down payment is so high. Therefore, I don't think prices are gonna go down very much. And second of all, because in Silicon Valley, still there is a very much demand for in people coming to work here, I still feel people will still wanna buy a home. But the, in the end of the day, I think for many of us as real estate agents, we love our job because if you love what you're buying and you enjoy the house, nobody knows what the future will bring. And therefore, goal is to enjoy the house. <laughs> well, this is a perfect transition uh, to the next segment where I wanted to ask about the changes that you may see taking place. I mean, obviously, we're just coming off a very, very unprecedentedly difficult year with COVID, which has for real estate been a big driver of prices as people move perhaps in and out of the areas, they get more space. And um, I want to talk about some of those changes that you're seeing in your respective markets. Um, so the first question that I had in mind is, should I buy now or should I sell now? And I think you've all sort of answered that question. It sounds like if you need to sell, sell. And if you need to buy, buy now. So maybe the other question I would ask is, are you what sort of trends are you seeing in terms of people moving in or out of your respective areas based upon what's happened in the last year and what you are seeing right now? I could address that um, in two parts. One, it changed uh, the near term future where I saw that many people who were able to adapt and work from home remotely, especially in areas, for example, in San Francisco, like SOMA, where many headquarters for Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook, 
Salesforce, they were told that they can work from home. They moved to areas in the suburbs, like such as Vallejo or even out of state where they had more space, especially outdoors and office space, especially for growing families. And then secondly, unfortunately, COVID has had a very disproportionate effect on the affluent and those um, who are lower income. Um, it's exacerbated the wealth gap and um, many people are still healing and questioning their job security. So I think that and unfortunately like for the lower income folks, um, it's, it's continued to be a challenge and it was already like that before COVID, mm -hmm. but I think it's even worse now. Uh, well, since we just talked about San Francisco, Lana, I know that you're specializing in San Francisco. Um, I mean, I've read so many headlines that talk about this just massive migration out of the city. Um, are you seeing that? I'm seeing that from renters. There are some homeowners who have left and they have sold their properties, but most of my clientele, I would go so far as to say 95% of my clientele over the last year have moved from rentals into home ownership or moved from a one bedroom apartment with a kid in the closet, literally their baby's, you know, uh, playpen was in the closet and they've moved up into a two or three bedroom mm -hmm. property. The hottest segment of the market right now in San Francisco is a three bedroom condo. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? It's a growing family, most likely moving to get more space and they need a second or third bedroom for either a child and or an office. So I'm seeing a lot of upsizing. I, am, I have a handful of clients who have left the city I also have a handful who left last year and who are coming back to buy again now. Mm -hmm. So it's a wide variety. What I have seen for mass migration is truly renters who are stacked up with multiples in properties that just didn't want to rent anymore and decided to go home to their parents. And I would say the bulk of them were under the age of 35. Okay, good. Herb, Daphna, anything to add? Any uh trends you've observed? Road always leads back. Sorry. I mean that, that the road always leads back. People come and go. Um, if you look at Silicon Valley and, and not Silicon Valley, and Bay Area, you have UC Berkeley, you have Stanford, high tech companies, the pharma companies. They're drawing from those universities. So you may hear about people leaving, but you're going to find people from Boston and New York, et cetera, are coming into the area. Um, Life changes also move people. I know myself, the fact that my grandkids are in Danville has now motivated me to move to Danville. Never would have thought about moving before, but I want to be near the grandkids as they get older. Hmm. So those things have an impact on the others as well. From my perspective, I think what's going on in both in my in my area is because the schools in San Francisco are not really great because people want more space, many of the areas that have very good schools and are close to BART and the freeway have really been an increased value. So because in Silicon Valley, as we know, people, both husband and wife have to work. Unfortunately, sometimes one partner live, works in San Francisco and one person works in San Jose. And therefore my area where I'm at, which is in Los Altos, is halfway both. So many times what we do sit in our office in Los Altos and say, okay, what can you, let's look at both sides and find out what's the best thing for you because commute is something very important. And I know we've all been spoiled, but we all know it's gonna happen. What's also uh, super interesting is mm -hmm. we have seen a lot of San Franciscans buy homes in Tahoe and Sonoma and sort of camp out during COVID there with the intention of coming back mm. and using those as their second homes for the duration. So that's been a really interesting trend where they've left San Francisco temporarily, moved into the greater Bay Area, but do plan to come back when their work goes back to hybrid. I also just want to add that as far as a trend for real estate, the types of properties that have been more desirable um, have changed in the sense that homes that are more versatile, that have workspace also, that have maybe an in-law unit where you could have your parents staying with you. Um, because I think that with COVID, we're definitely going to have a significant number of people continue to remain at home for work. 
that those types of spaces that are more versatile mm -hmm. are more attractive now. Well, we you touched on a good point, which is there are different types of properties, right? And I think Ilana had mentioned this as well, that you're seeing this discrepancy in pricing. Some parts of the city are doing great, others are not so well. And Daphne brought this on as well, is that affordability has been a big challenge for a lot of folks, especially those that may not have a ton of stock options and don't have monopoly money, as you call it. Do you have any any advice, any any thoughts for those, whether first time home buyers or those with growing families that need to get more space, but are getting priced out because they're not compete, able to compete with a lot of folks with stock uh, money? That's really interesting because I was thinking of what it is that has always been a fact. So what I tell my clients who can't afford so much, the most important thing is to find the location that's best for them, get the floor plan that fits their needs. And the most important thing is if they are concerned about the market and don't have a lot of money, if are they willing to take a dump, an ugly duckling, an ugly place with cosmetic work and fix it slowly because one way or another, you can make money if you fix the place up. Hmm. That's a good answer. Um, good. We have in San Francisco, a product called Tenancies in Common. And typically in a down market, they are the first thing to lose value. Hmm. And then they are the last thing to come back in an up market. I would say right now, that is probably the best value in San Francisco. And there aren't a lot of realtors that understand them. And I have had clients get 30% more than, uh, than a similar condo. So the prices are still a little bit lower. The interest rates are a tiny bit higher, but the value that you can get in a TIC right now, if I were putting my money somewhere, that's, that's where I would go if I wanted more. And also Roman, to help put your question into perspective, the cost of a median single family home in the state of California is $700,000. And according to the California Association of Realtors in San Francisco, the median single family is over 1.6 million. Here, there would need to be a household income of at least $300,000 in order to afford that median single family home. And so, of course, that creates an affordability issue. So I would say to a buyer to try to keep an open mind and don't, don't let the perfection be the enemy of good. I've had buyers who were set on living in a certain neighborhood. Um, as an example, they, they bought in the Excelsior uh, with me a few years ago, and it wasn't at the top of their list, but they're now very happy being there. If I would like to add one more thing that popped in my head, which I find it very interesting has happened in the last five years. For some people who know where East, San, East Palo Alto is, Palo Alto is a very expensive area. And the trick right now is to buy a property. If you can't afford too much, is to buy on the border of a really good neighborhood because it seems like in a short period of time, that neighborhood changes its look and has more demand. So that's another way to buy property. That's what I tell my clients. Look at the long term rather than the short term. Hmm. Yeah. Herb, do you have anything to add to this question? I think just setting realistic ex expectations. Everybody wants more than what they can afford. It's pretty common. And what I what I see out of buyers sometimes is that they will move further away. They'll buy something they don't really want. They'll move onto a busy street. In a downturn, if there is another downturn, that property on a busy street is, is going to be a detriment. Buy something in a neighborhood you want. Maybe it's a little smaller. Maybe it doesn't have all the amenities that you'd like to have but location is important. So just set realistic expectations. The number location one- Location over the house. Location, location, the... location. Right, I think we've heard that before. Good locations will always sell. Um, I know that there's, a, and I'm not gonna hold you to this question, but, or answering this question, but if you could uh, give this some thought because a lot of people, especially those that are on the fence and they, cannot get that perfect house or they cannot get that perfect house in that neighborhood. And they're often feeling a bit stuck. Do they continue to stay where they are and save so that they can get the house that they might want in a neighborhood that they might want down the road? 
or do they move now because all the savings that they might have is just going to end up increasing the purchase price even further. So here's the question. Do you have a sense of what percentage our real estate, Bay Area real estate market would continue to grow in a year over year? Or do you have any historical perspectives to share with our viewers? Well, San Francisco, if you look back over the last hundred years, we, as I said, we go in 10 year cycles and we just go up and up and up and up and up and up. It just, it looks a lot like this. Mm -hmm. So if you just get in, even if you stay in your first place for five to seven years, you can climb the property ladder and ride the gains over time. Real estate is not a short term thing. It is a long term thing. So there is no better way to make money in real estate than in real estate. The stock market doesn't climb the way Bay Area real estate prices climb. So get into something to get into the market. As we say, get on the carousel, just get on it and then ride it and just go through the waves. There's no way to time the market. I mean, we couldn't have known there was a pandemic, but if you hold on long enough, it's much like the stock market that it will always go up here because there is such a demand for housing. People are, are always coming. So buy and hold. I'm gonna dovetail on some of that because I agree with you. I, I would recommend to my own child, buy. Everybody wants to wait and then you can become outpriced. I, I was had an open house in Foster City and older gentleman, senior came into the house. He could have been reaching 90. And very loudly, he says, Herb, I paid too much for my home. And this, and this was when open houses existed and all kinds of people were in there. And I was like, I, I'm really sorry to hear that. What, what happened? But he said, everybody told me I paid too much. I said, excuse me, sir, tell me about that. I paid $12,000 for my house. <laughs> everybody told me I could have gotten it for eight. Now it's only worth 2.2. I mean, in retrospect, it's a long-term investment, but it's your home. It's a place that you're going to live. It's forced savings. Buy it sooner versus later, you're gonna get outpriced. I would like to add, as an immigrant who came from, a, from Israel with very little cash, uh, got married when I was 19, um, the real, buying real estate was the most important thing. And I do, bought it real dumb. But I always tell my clients, if you don't, you have to start someplace. Calculate it as a five-year plan. The idea is the price goes up, which we did. We refinanced the house and we bought a bigger house and a bigger house. And nobody gets, even if you can afford a mil, five million dollar house, or nobody gets everything they want. So you just have to start someplace. Um, These are all really also, sorry. I would also Go just ahead, add, lastly, uh, whether one should buy now or later for me it's so circumstantial and it depends obviously on one's um, personal uh, job and financial situation and a detailed analysis of that I, I don't believe in buying at all costs and i also think of course if it's if you're not going to be here long term then it's worth potentially you know stepping back and seeing if this is really worthwhile i i have seen buyers get in over their heads at times so i i take a more conservative approach and um, I think it's definitely circumstantial. I can only say I've been doing this for 40 years and none of my clients have ever lost money if they held the property for more than three years. I think the long-term uh, mindset is important. Absolutely. So before we shift to the next segment, I just wanted to um, remind those folks that are watching us live, if you have any questions for the panel, to feel free to put them into the comment section of whatever social media platform you happen to be watching us on. And then we will try to get to your answers or your questions and provide you with answers before we end. But as we jump over to the next segment, which is a good uh, transition point, because you know, despite all the changes that have continued to take place, uh, that's probably one of the constants that we have in life. No one knows what the future holds. You know, we're all uh, <laughs> experiencing change in different ways, but what would you say, as we move into this next segment, are some of the long-standing truths that have really stood the test of time that you can offer to our viewers, whether they are buyers, or sellers. 
Herb, you want to start with start us off? Sure. Um, if you want to maximize your investment when you're selling, you have to bite the bullet a bit and do some basics: paint, paint and stage, as as well as curb appeal. I know people don't like to feel like they have to put money into a home they're selling, but you're going to get every penny back. On the buying side is location. Simple as that. That's where I'm going to leave it at the moment. Thank you. And I would add to that in San Francisco specifically, um, I always like to say over prepare. So do everything to your home, over prepare it, make it as perfect as you can get it and humbly price it because we tend to price a little on the low side to get competition to drive the price up. So perfectly prepare, over prepare, price it humbly. The buyers will come and the price will go up. That's for the sellers, for the buyers. I would say make sure you're working with somebody who understands the nuances of the market, can really guide you through how that pricing structure works in whatever area you are in and understand, for example, now that when you see a price, that is an offer price. It is different from a selling price. And knowing that you're looking in the right price point to be able to go up in price when you actually write the offer in order to win the property. Knowing that strategy and working with someone who can guide you through it is really, really important. And then of course, location. It's always about location. Where you live is about your lifestyle and what you want to get out of your lifestyle. The four walls you live in, you can make your own, but you cannot change where those four walls are. Can't move your house. <laughs> Joan, you want to be next or shall I go next? Sure. Just as a fundamental truth for me, if you're a seller, I would say, as Alana said, don't overlook the small details. Try to make your property you know, look as beautiful as possible, whether it's making it, you know, staged and, and having it vacant and making the, the right preparations as, in terms of improvements and curb appeal and staging, um, that's all going to come back. It's really an investment. And then I would also add that as a seller, if you're going to be remodeling and improving your property over the years, try to make it so it appeals to the masses um, in the sense that you know, I've seen people put down some really questionable finishes and very unusual kind of convoluted additions. Um, and oftentimes that can be a drawback when you're trying to sell later and if it's too eccentric. I would like to add a couple more things. Is never buy the largest home in a neighborhood. Hmm. Schools will always keep the price in good value. Except in San Francisco. When you don't have good schools, right? We have good schools, but it's on a lottery system. So. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, from a seller's perspective, don't sell until you're ready. Make sure you are good. If you're going to put the house on the market in the next three years, start now because otherwise I'm going to come three years later and you're going to fix the place for somebody else rather than yourself. You might as well call your real estate agent three years in advance, find out what needs to do, enjoy it and get increased value when you sell it. And also be neutral, be ready to buy, be, be neutral on knowing that your house is not yours anymore. Um, from a buyer's perspective, I think it's very important. And I think that as a real estate agent, I learned that myself. If you're going to buy a property, go on the weekend, sit down in the neighborhood you love, Look at the neighborhood and decide who your neighbors are going to be. Are you going to be comfortable being there at nighttime? Because as a real estate agent, we don't live in that neighborhood and only you could see if it makes, feel, it makes you feel good. So safety is really important. And therefore, I'm saying is, and the other thing I was going to say is, don't look at all, if today many people are using, looking at internet and looking at all these beautiful houses that are all staged. Don't look at the staging. Look at the floor plan. Hmm. Roma, can I have one more piece, please? Of course, please. Um, everybody on this panel is experienced. And so I just, I want to suggest to any buyer or seller is to use an experienced agent. 
a lot of times you run into friends who have become agents or somebody young who's breaking into the, the career, their career. It's okay to use a new agent, but they need to be mentored by somebody to help guide them through the process. It's your biggest investment possibly in your entire life. Just trust me, use an experienced agent to help you through this, this um, direction. Can I add one more thing? Daphne, go ahead. Go ahead. I was thinking about my empty nesters. Um, many sellers just decide to sell their house. But if you're an empty, less, an empty nester, you should really contact a real estate agent who specializes as a senior citizen. Because the truth of the matter is, when we have little money or we have kids, it's really easy. Schools are important, and therefore, that's what we buy. When, when you have an empty nester, you have so many choices. Your kids push you around, tell you what to do. So you need to sit three years in advance and really look at what was going to make you happy before you sell your house. So that, like, for example, I suggest that if you're an empty nester, you if you're moving anywhere, you should rent for one year, see how you like it, and only then sell your property. So really, as a person who's selling their house, as an empty nester, it's real. I spend a lot of time coaching my clients to make sure that they don't move out of the area and then can't come back to California. And second of all, they're really making themselves happy, not their kids. Well, that's a that's a good. Elana, I mean, you might be picking up on the kind of question as well, but that may be a, a good follow up question before we wrap up. Is do you have any insights specific for the life stages of your clients? But before we jump into that, Alana, you were going to say something. I had one more thought because right now, part of the challenge that many sellers are facing if they're not leaving the area entirely is how am I going to buy something before I sell my house? And there are a lot of ways to get bridge loans, to borrow against assets. And I would really, really encourage anybody who could to sell before they, no, sorry, to buy before they sell. Because as prices are rising, you want to buy while the prices are lower and sell while the prices are higher. So if you can secure a property, which may take some time in a hot market like this, prior to selling, your money will go further because you're going to buy here and you're going to sell here. So look at work with a realtor who can turn you towards lenders to understand how you can make that possible in a time like this. Great. That's a good, good tip as well. So with the last question, before we wrap up, um, do you have any insight for folks that maybe are a young family getting into their first home or maybe the peak career folks that may have, you know, kids that have gotten more active, they're bigger, they take more space, they need a bigger home, or perhaps that other part of life where, you know, the home has too many bedrooms to clean and now you may need to downsize. So pick whichever one you preferred to talk on and perhaps give our audience some uh, insight. Well, one insight I can offer uh, that involves all stages is just in my experience professionally and personally is that I bought a duplex uh, with my family in the Richmond district. My parents-in-law live on the bottom unit and we live in the top unit. And it's really helped us um, significantly in terms of being able to combine resources and also with the my parent, my parents-in-law being able to help watch the kids and us being able to spend you know, Shabbats every Friday together. And I find that having worked with especially nonprofits and even synagogues in Chabad, um, that this is a very common way to help save um, if you could buy that type of property. And I realize it may not apply to everybody, but it's worth exploring if you are in that position. Great. Thanks, Joan. Go ahead, Daphne. So, <laughs> so back to my empty nesters. I have feel that one of the things people forget in the empty nester situation is if the if, if you're going to retire and you're going to try to buy something else, you should get your you should make sure you have money to be able to buy something else without selling your home because the scariest thing is which comes first, selling the house or buying it. So 
the interest rates are much better while you're working versus when you're retiring. I do have lenders who will do it if you're retired, but the bottom line is, talk to Roman about financial aspect, but the bottom line is your house is still the place to take the money to, to, to use that to go to a new place. And also, uh, I would like to say that it's naturally takes about three years to make a move when your kids are out of the house. So don't let your kids push you. Thanks, Daphne. Herb? I, I think I'm going to refer to this as right sizing hmm. as opposed to downsizing or anything else. Um, and there's a lot to cover there, but I, I look at seniors and seniors is, I don't know how to define that these days, but you have a multi-story home, you have lots of stairs and you start thinking ahead. I, I would move before you're forced to move. And I hate to say it that way, but move into something you can enjoy as opposed to the point where you can't do the stairs anymore. And now you're struggling. It's so, it's so difficult to move. So do it while you're healthy enough to enjoy it. Um, I, I think there's many life changes we go through if you're thinking about selling because you're planning anyway to move back east or the Midwest or some other being near family. Do it now. Prices are, are, are very attractive. You can get a lot for your house and nice time. You're still healthy enough to sell your home. Why wait until you're, you're at an age where it's difficult? Anyway, I can ramble, but I'm a big <laughs> believer in real estate. I've bought investment properties myself. I've had them through the downturn. The rental properties still brought rent in, even though the prices dropped for a little while. I okay. still collected rent. So I, I believe in real estate. Thanks, Herb. I think that's one thing I can find in common among all four of you. Um, but before we wrap up, Ilana, did you want to add anything to either one of those three uh, categories of folks or? Sure, sure. So I can give some practical advice. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of younger clients. And one thing I definitely notice is they want it to look like an Instagram photo. They want to move in and it should look perfect. And I would say really be conscious of the fact that when you move in, it's not going to look like it looks. You can take an ugly duckling and turn it into an Instagram moment. You just need to have some clever design help. And there are a lot of online design sites. There are a lot of different ways you work with a good realtor who can point out where furniture can go. Be mindful of the different colors that are on the wall and know that you're not moving into Instagram. You're moving into a home and your things are going to go in there. So how does the layout work for you? I would also really recommend for those who are working, let your employer know that you're looking for a home. You may have to drop on a dime and run out to see a property. In this market right now in San Francisco where it is so crazy and busy and very fast paced, a property may come on on Friday and be gone on Sunday. When it comes on the market, you go, you see it. If you sleep on it, you're not going to sleep in it. You have to move very quickly. Decisions have to be made and it's not a lifetime commitment. You can stay for five years and move into something else. And that is the joy of real estate is you can keep changing your surroundings and usually make some money while you do it. It's a long term plan. So That sounds pretty good. Well, I before we wrap up again, I just want to say thank you again, because you've shared not only some of your sage wisdom and experience from years in the business, but you also offer a human element to this that really helps to you know put this into much bigger and better perspective. And so before we wrap up, do you have any final just lightning round, one bit of advice or one bit of a lasting uh, comment that you would want to leave our viewers with? Okay, so I'm an optimist, but for those sellers who are procrastinating, waiting for the prices to go up there is a possibility that taxes are going to change and generally when that happens there is a possibility that many people who have been waiting are going to put their houses on the market to move away for tax purposes so unless you have a reason to keep your house interest rates are down it's a great market just do it there we go Adopting a Nike slogan. Anyone else? My Final lightning thought. slogan 
Uh, my lightning round slogan will be just to keep an open mind. Good. Mine, oh, Alana? mine would be have fun with it. This is a really exciting time. If you're mm. either buying into your new home or selling and making tons of money in this market, like what a better time to be doing this. It's so much fun. It's so exciting. And just where are you going to land? It's like the big mystery, right? And when you find that perfect home, it's like falling in love. You know when you meet your person and you know when the right offer comes through, get good guidance and enjoy the process. It's fun. <laughs> That's great. Herb? Never say never. If, if you want to sell, then do it. If you want to buy, do it. Don't procrastinate. And your prices are just going to continue to go up. It, it's a great time to buy and sell. I love it. Well, thank you all, Daphna, Joan, Ilana, Herb. Thank you so much. We're going to make sure to put all of your contact information and links in the email that's going to follow along with the recording of this conversation. Again, thank you so very much. And uh, be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you again. Roman, thank, thank you, Roman. Thank you. And thank you for the Jewish, the Hebrew free loan. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care, everybody.